How's it going, Jeremy? It's uh, great to finally have you on the podcast here. It's uh, It's been definitely a crazy couple months for me with a newborn and whatnot and getting used to that whole thing. But uh, I'm glad and excited to finally have you on. Well, con- first of all, congrats, Joe. And second, thank you. It is a pleasure to be on here. I remember how, when my kids were little, I know what a difficult balancing act that is. I'm at the other end of the journey. Mine are now 23 and 19. So, I, you know, I don't really miss those days in a way, but at the same time, I kind of do. They're a lot of fun when they're little. Yeah. It, from what I hear, it's like you miss it when they're little, like, you know, them, them being so little. But um, like the struggles, you know, up in the middle of the night, no sleep. And yeah, you have yeah. to do a full work day, right? Like <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not always a normal work day, right? Like when you work in IT and security, as we all know, you're always kind of carrying a pager, whether it's a literal one or a <laughs> figurative one in the form of, you know, Slack and SMS notifications for things that you got to pay attention to. So, yeah. I wish you the best in the journey. And again, congrats. It's got to be, uh, in, enjoy the time. Yeah, thanks. So Jeremy, you know, I, I start everyone off with getting into how they got into security or IT overall. The reason why I start there is because I there there is a section of my audience that are trying to get into IT or security. And yeah. I feel like always hearing someone's background is helpful, right? Because maybe it's, maybe it's that background that matches up with them and they can hear like, Oh, this is a possible thing for me. Um, which is, it's interesting because I've done probably over 140 episodes by now. And, uh, I haven't heard the same background once. Yeah. And I don't think you're going to hear the same background from me either. Cause my upbringing was pretty weird in many ways, super nomadic, By the time I finished high school, I'd lived in four states and four countries, spoke a few different languages, went through a very circuitous journey through college. I actually dropped out of college twice, uh, once here, once in Finland, um, re-enrolled and completely changed directions in my studies partway through. And without going through all the details of it, to answer your question, how did I end up in security? I kind of failed into it in a way. So after that second time of dropping out of college, I moved back to the US from Finland where I'd been studying chemical engineering. And I decided to study linguistics at this program at University of North Carolina where they had kind of this intersection of computer science and linguistics called computational linguistics. Really worked well for my background. I had a lot of Well, I spoke a few different languages pretty fluently at that point. I had a lot of kind of exposure to a lot of languages. And, you know, in Finland uh, at that time, in the early 90s, when I was going through school, uh, Linux had just been created, actually not at my school, but at the school right across town. And Mm. so a lot of our labs were running on Linux. So I had good exposure to some of these kind of new operating systems and things that were coming out. So this intersection of computer science and linguistics was like perfect for me in a way. But when I say I failed into security, it's because I thought I would actually actually end up being a programmer, but turns out I suck at coding. And so I went through, got my degree, got a job with a company doing translation software or software designed to help human translators. So again, it's like the perfect convergence of all the things in my background that would make it good, but I wasn't good enough to program on our own software. And the company was growing really fast at the time. So they came to me and they said, hey, look, you're not going to cut it in the software development team, but we've got real big needs on IT infrastructure because of all the growth that we're having. We're opening new offices in a bunch of countries. You know, we've got a lot of network capacity that we need to expand. We're going through an IT professionalization kind of process. Things, all, everything on the IT side had been done very shoestring up to that point. You know, this is in the days when we would have had a file server that was just a tower sitting under somebody's desk. Right. And so we were going from that into actually having server rooms and, you know, having raised floor for the first time. And, you know, if some of these terms go over our audience's head, who's all born in the cloud, they're like, what is raised floor? I I get it. But, you know, that's how I got into IT in general. And we didn't really have a strong distinction between IT and security in those days. It was all just, you know, one team. You took care of everything. We did everything from installing drivers and standard, um, you know, laptop and desktop setup to 
install antivirus, patch operating systems, run boot scripts that forced updates to operating systems so people couldn't fall too far behind. All of that kind of stuff fell into, you know, into my domain. And I stayed with that company for seven years, kind of worked my way up through the ranks of IT and, and security. Had, by the way, like the two biggest breaches of my career, both at that company. Happy to talk about both of those. I think the statute of limitations for staying quiet on them has has well passed by this point, but um, some fun lessons learned out of that. And, um, you know, and I, I, I kind of stayed in IT and in security as a practitioner for the next, well, 13 years in total at the first half of my career and then kind of transitioned over on, more onto the vendor side. So not a typical journey, I would say, but um, I, I really learned a lot over the over that 25-ish years that I've been working in IT. Hmm. So with, you know, a, a background of all that travel, speaking different languages and whatnot, was there ever a pull to go into any of the federal agencies or anything like that? I would think that that would be um, a skill set that would be extremely tempting for, for them, you know, and yeah. at least – from my own experience, right? Like I tried to go into federal law enforcement yeah. right out of college. And, um, I, I mean, they, they could have, they could have sent me anywhere, right? Like I could have signed yeah. up with any of the agencies and they sent me anywhere. Right. Yeah. I would have been cool with it. It would have been fun. It would have been yeah. the perfect time to do it. Did, was there ever that kind of temptation or oh, curiosity sure. on your end? For sure. Have you ever seen the movie spies like us? I don't think I have. It's great. It's from the 80s. Chevy Chase, Dan Aykroyd. One of the scenes in there, they're taking what's called the Foreign Service exam. Um, and that's the process through which you kind of uh, apply to become a State Department representative. I have twice taken that exam, twice passed it, uh, twice made it all the way through to the final stage of interviews, and both times failed out on that final stage um, for different reasons. You know, mm. uh, once when I was 22 and once when I was 36 ish and very different reasons. I was uh, very different levels of maturity, but both times I'm glad that it didn't work out. Um, there's a number of other reasons. You know, I think my career on that side would have been limited anyway because I am a dual national. And so I think I would have been somewhat limited in how far I could have gotten clearances and all that good stuff. Mm. But certainly there was a pull in that direction, Joe, and I did explore it. Didn't work out. And that's just the path that that I ended up going down. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, um, it, it's weird how stressful those interviews and that whole process can be. Oh and it's like uh, it's stressful in ways that you wouldn't even expect. You know, like there was um, I think yeah, the the I believe the NDA and this one was up a few years ago. Right. But I was interviewing for the Secret Service. And uh, that one, the physical test was like the hardest physical test I've ever been put through in my entire life. That that, that was crazy. Um, you know, 15 minutes into it, you're gassed and it's a two hour test, right? <laughs> like it, oh my gosh. It, it's insane. Um, but the interview part is the part that I struggled with. It, it was asking, you know, random, seemingly random questions that would fall under that type A personality that they're looking for. Um, and you trying to recall it under situations where, you know, they just read the question you have to answer, right? They're not giving you any clarifying answers or anything like that. They can repeat the question. Um, and while you're talking, they're writing down every single word that you say, right? So that that's yeah. a whole stress factor right there. Um, and then yeah. them not even reacting to your answer, not nodding, not, you know, smiling, not nothing. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, I don't know what is going on here. You know, for someone fresh out of college like myself to go through that process, it was like the, all these other interviews, like it's going to be easier than this, yeah. you know, for the yeah. for the normal <laughs> private sector. Right. Like it's oh, um, for sure. it's a crazy experience. Uh, I mean, both times I the final stage of the State Department process is a full day uh, role play scenario on site. Oh, and, you know, you're thrust into a bunch of different situations, which on the one hand is fine for me. I, I did improv comedy for a number of years. I'm very comfortable getting thrown into random situations. 
no issues at all. But to your point, you don't understand or you don't know what you're being graded against. And you're getting almost no feedback along the way. And I just think about, you know, kind of day to day meetings that you and I sit in, you know, whether it's in person or Zoom, you've at least got some kind of visual feedback coming from the other side as we're talking, you know, I can see you nodding your head. I know you're listening, you're paying attention, but zero from the evaluators in these contexts. All you get at the end of this full day is kind of a yes or no and maybe like two to three sentences of why it didn't work out if it didn't. Interviewing, I think, is still one of the things that we don't do well. By the way, also true in security. I don't think we're great at interviewing and I don't think we're great at like giving people the opportunity to break into security. Yeah, that was, you know, my that, that was probably my biggest hurdle. Um with getting a break into security, you know, just getting a chance from someone, you know, it it literally took me almost three years to get into security. And that's with me getting certifications, starting a master's, you know, doing owning all of security at my current company, but I didn't have a security title. And so people looked at me differently, didn't give me the chance or anything like that. Um, And I just remember one of the most frustrating parts was, you know, someone, someone said I didn't get the job. And I asked, I said, Hey, you know, why didn't I get the job? What can I improve on? What did I do bad? Or what do I need to do differently to get a job next time? And they said, well, you didn't have any experience with Splunk. You know, I worked for at this time, I worked for a very small company, like 30 people. There was no way we were ever going to get Splunk. And there was no way that I was ever going to have a chance at affording you know, 30 seconds of a Splunk instance in, yeah, in my yeah, home yeah. lab, you know? And yeah. so, you know, it, it's like you're in an impossible situation. You're grading me against an impossible scenario that literally will never yeah. exist. How? Yeah. Why wouldn't you take someone that's willing to learn, eager to learn, maybe knows a few things, right? Has experience on help desk and train them up rather than just saying, and, oh, they don't know this industry-wide tool. <laughs> yeah, And that's crazy because, you know, in that scenario in particular, whether you know a particular tool or not, I think is the least important thing in somebody's, you know, application for a position. If I think about, you know, kind of the priority list of things that I think are important in hiring a security person, number one is just kind of the frame of mind that you bring to the question about how you address security. So if you're thinking about joining a new organization, Do you think about it on a point to point or point by point basis? Or do you think of like a threat model and kind of prioritization? Because security is one of those things that is truly never done. You know, every single day, something will change within the organization that needs to be thought about reassessed. Maybe it's just the volume of transactions. Maybe it's a new employee, somebody coming or going, whatever it may be. It may be a change in a cloud environment. I mean, all of these things are are happening on a daily basis. And so you are never done. But the point is like, do you come in and all you're going to do is focus on one tool that you know? No, like you should really have a more kind of strategic view on approaching security in an organization. Maybe you start with a threat modeling, maybe you start with like a framework of kind of security evaluation. You know, there's always questions of prioritizations and trade-offs because ultimately, and I know this is, you know, a little bit of a cliche, security is a risk management thing, right? Like the most secure organization is the, is the organization that does nothing, right? <laughs> Generates no data, processes no data, has no data, right? But that's just not the reality. You always have to work with data and with people. And so it's always just a question of what trade-offs you want to make. And so you need to think about that. And like the second thing in my mind is the creativity and the troubleshooting capabilities. So to your point, your experience doing help desk, I'm sure you had a number of times when somebody came and was like, hey, it doesn't work. You know, gives you the least useful information that they can give you. And then it's your job to figure out why. And you end up going through this, you know, troubleshooting exercise of eliminating possible causes. I actually think security has a lot of that as well. And when you've checked everything, then you just need to think more creatively, what else could it be? And by the way, like you know, we all know most of the time it's it's a lot of the basics. It's DNS, it's you know, update to the latest patch version, whatever, it's reboot the machine, 
Like we all know that from experience over time, but yeah, I don't know. I don't think the fact that you do or don't know a tool should ever qualify you or disqualify you from a job. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. So you mentioned um, a couple breaches. Why, why yeah. don't we talk about the breaches? Maybe yeah. if you could talk about where you were, what they were, yeah. how it happened, and you know what that environment was like. Because I, I feel like um, you know this is a known thing slash risk with security, and very few people actually go through a very you know legitimate breach, right? And so yeah. it's difficult to imagine it. It's um, it's hard to go through to know what to do. Even it can be very stressful. Yep. It's kind of like a fog Super. of war almost. Right. Yeah. And so I think hearing that would be very helpful to someone out there, especially myself. Yeah. I, so I've had three in my career, uh, two that were kind of larger than the others. The one that was the smallest is probably the easiest one to talk about. You know, it was an internal wiki that through one network configuration change got made external. And it got picked up very quickly. We were doing a lot of social media marketing at the time, trying to work with bloggers and, and so on. And there was some stuff on our wiki that didn't paint the bloggers in the best light. And that got out there and got copy pasted and screenshotted and posted on other mm. blogger sites and so on. And, you know, it was a certainly a black eye to the organization. Thankfully, nothing beyond kind of the marketing side and, and uh, some customer support documentation got shared externally. So we were able to kind of dodge the bullet. The reputational damage, though, was pretty tough to deal with. And certainly, you know, the possibility of working with some of those bloggers on, let's say, like content placement or content syndication, that was all gone. You know, that ship had sailed. There was no chance that these people were ever going to consider working with us after that point. And, you know, that took some time to repair um, and certainly, you know, forced the marketing team to go, OK, what's plan B? What are we going to work on next? And it does show you that this was kind of one of the first kind of virtualized environments that I worked in. So this was um, a lot of open source software. We were using MediaWiki at the time for the internal documentation, the same platform that Wikipedia is built on. Um, hmm. decent open source package has its own set of issues as, as many of those large scale kind of public facing things, especially ones built in PHP do, um, you know, we had relatively good practices around the wiki itself. And so there was nothing on media wiki itself. That was a problem. It was really just our network configuration that, that caused this exposure. So, you know, one of those things is whenever you consider a network change, what are the implications? And I think a lot of people don't have the awareness. I, a lot of organizations that I go talk to, if you ask somebody the question, what happens if I change this one firewall rule or this one IP address or this one load balancer pointing from which instances to which instances, like what's going to change? What would then become exposed? I still think a lot of people don't have that visibility. And that is uh, something that I think a lot of security teams struggle with. The other two were worse. Uh, they were at that uh, um, first company that I joined where I worked my way through up through IT. This is again, kind of the late 90s, early 2000s timeframes. One of the things that we ended up having to build for our customer support organization was an anonymous FTP upload server. Hmm. So we had customers working on very large documents Probably dating myself a little bit, but there were uh, desktop publishing software packages, mostly from Adobe. Mm -hmm. I think none of them exist anymore, but you might hear of like PageMaker, FrameMaker. Um, I think InDesign is the new tool that's replaced all of that kind of stuff. Uh, Quark Express was another product in that same category. Or then sometimes they were just like really large word files. And back in those days, most email clients couldn't do anything more than, you know, maybe a three to five megabyte attachment. And we very often had customers that had documents that were well into the hundreds of megabytes. They would have problems using our software with those documents, and they would need to upload those documents to our customer support team. So we had an old server that wasn't really used for any other purposes. And we said, hey, this will be great. It's got, you know, reasonably large uh, RAID on it. 
got about you know 25 gigs of disk space on it that are completely unused. Again, 25 gigs was big back then, by the way. So um, we set up this server to be an anonymous FTP server. So you could connect an FTP client. You would not get a directory listing. So you couldn't see any of the files. You couldn't download anything. If you tried to list or download, you would just get an error message. But if you tried to just put a file, that worked. And that was by design. And so then you would submit, you as a customer would submit your support case and then give your file name. Mm. Now, the fact that it was an old server is actually where one of our biggest problems started. So it didn't support Windows NT4. So we were still running NT3.5, I want to say, or 3. I can't remember what version. Uh, everything was 8.3 nomenclature, meaning file names, max eight characters, extension, max three characters. Um, what ended up happening was there was this vulnerability in that Windows version where if you created a folder that let's call the folder dash, so just the hyphen symbol, and then you create a subfolder of dash called double dash, and you create a subfolder of that called triple dash. Well, once you go down and you surpass 256 characters in total path length, none of the permissions work anymore. Hmm. So it completely broke the Windows permission structure. So some people knew of this. We obviously didn't. So what did they do? They uploaded a few gigabytes of pornography, shared the links, and because it was so deeply down this path structure, the download permissions that we had prohibited were all of a sudden available. Now, we got notified of this when we got our bandwidth bill from our colocation provider at the end of the month. And for an organization that averaged roughly like four gigabytes of bandwidth utilization at that site, all of a sudden we were in the 200 range. Wow. And you know, thankfully, we were able to kind of show them, hey, you know, it was this kind of breach event. And thankfully, they didn't steal data from us, but they did abuse our systems to distribute, you know, illegal content. Um, you know, what can we do here? And, and you know, they gave us a, cert, a break on that. But it's one of those things that to me that that actually showed me that we were doing a terrible job of monitoring our own systems. So we didn't have anything in place to check bandwidth utilization on a regular basis, or even to really like monitor the uh, disk drive space. Um, you know, it didn't fill the disk, but it certainly used a huge chunk of the disk and we weren't monitoring that actively at the time. So it's a little bit of a live and learn lesson, right? So some of these basics that you need to think about, you know, even just like checking in, if you're, if you're using servers as servers, as like, you know, long lived servers and not ephemeral instances, you do need to check in. You do need to put these monitoring tools in place. And so, yeah, those are they're two of the big ones. The third one was nothing really major, you know, just kind of usual email virus. Um, did send some documents from people's inboxes. One of these uh, people may have heard of like the Melissa virus or the I love you virus from those days. We got hit with a couple of those. And most of them just created huge volumes of email traffic. Some of them would send uh, documents from your send folder. They would forward them outside. Nothing huge there, thankfully. Mm. Um, a few documents that went out, but mostly just like clogged up our mail servers for a few days. And, you know, that virus would then flare up again from time to time. Somebody would come back from vacation, see it in their inbox and, you know, double click the document with the word macro that kicked the whole thing off again. So it took a while. We ended up having to go into, into the exchange server and go into people's mailboxes. Uh, one by one across the organization and make sure that there were no copies in anybody's email anywhere. Hmm. Yeah. Those, those are some of my fun stories. Yeah. You know, the, the only breach experience that I have actually, and it wasn't even my environment being breached when I was working at a credit bureau, uh, Equifax happened and it, you know, obviously I wasn't working for Equifax. I was at a different place. But, you know, there was such, um, there was so much fear in the space that we literally got a blank check, you know, for the first time ever, like from the CEO, just saying, whatever you need, you know, just get it. If you need to hire more people, you can do it. Our, our team size quadrupled, 
you know, almost overnight within the next few months, we were hiring several people. And in, I mean, in security, that's unheard of. That's, yeah, that is something uh, that you do not expect that is extremely difficult to pull off, even just hiring yeah. those people. Um, yeah. You know, and, and that was a really interesting time. There was a lot of fear around it. And, you know, to, to, to give credit where it's due, right? The security team knew that. And we knew that we had to use that opportunity as the opportunity to, you know, get some of the tools that we've been trying to get, to get the headcount that we've been trying to get. Um, and I remember one of the architects was discussing, you know, how much, how much money the, the breach actually cost Equifax and the number that they could come up with, you know, the dollar amount, right, was in the billions, something like that. But yep. the damage to the brand itself was almost incalculable because now, you know, I bring up Equifax and everyone remembers that breach. I mean, you know, it was on yeah. morning news telling people go lock your credit reports and everything else, right? because they have all this data. There's nothing we can do about it. They just have it and they sell it yep. and they reuse it. Um, it really like almost opened Pandora's box to the credit bureaus in a way that people yeah. didn't really, didn't really notice, you know, didn't even know about or think about beforehand. Um, so it was, a, it was a very yeah. interesting time for sure. Yeah. And I'm curious your experience going through that when you kind of got this blank checkbook what did you do first? Yeah, I think what we did first was we actually bought two different technologies for the IAM uh, team, which was sold in a way that like, hey, if Equifax had these, the breach would have been impossible, right? So that was like a no-brainer for the organization to do. And then we built you know, teams of 12 or more people around these tools to run them for, for the entire organization, which was challenging, right? Because then you're questioning the talent that you're actually hiring, the people that you're bringing in, how you're bringing them in and, you know, all this stuff. We ran into challenges where we had more, we had like more interns or people fresh out of college than we had, people that were actually, you know, two to three years in IT overall, <laughs> you know, like I think at one point I was the only person on the team that had prior IT experience. And so when you oh, build a team like that in security, I mean, it's, it's different, right? You're restricted with yep. what you can actually do, what you can accomplish and pull off and whatnot. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I I'm curious then, you know, to follow up on that. So you bought this IAM tool that was sold as if you had this, that couldn't have happened. What, after you implemented it, did you have that same conclusion? Did like, did you believe that that was true? So, so I understood where they were coming from and, you know, they weren't the only solution on the market. That's for sure. Um, yep. If their solution was working you know, 100% of the time, the way that they claimed it would be working, then, then yeah, it, it would have been the right tool for the environment. And it would have done what they wanted it to do and things like that. But, you know, to yeah. be quite honest, the solution that we bought um, due to, you know, external circumstances, right, uh, was just the wrong solution for the environment. And so, yeah. you know, there was there was key people in my org that basically, you know, hitched their horses to this wagon and they were going to they were either going to succeed or they were going to die with it. And they ended up, you know, not not actually dying with it, but they died with it, you know, and um, it, it created a lot of issues, a lot of heartburn, you know, for for basically everyone in the yeah. org. I've been on the vendor side of security software for about seven, eight years now. And the thing, there, there's a couple of things in what you said that I, that really kind of stick with me. Number one is, I think anybody who says that their solution is bulletproof or is the silver bullet to solving this and preventing the next one and so on, 
is like, I think anybody who hears that should know that that's marketing speak, right? And to your point, it may be the right solution or it may be the right category of solution, but if it requires that you change the way that your organization works in order to use it, I think its chances of success are very low within your organization. So I just don't see a lot of the customers that I've worked with over the years saying, well, you tell me how to run security or how to run cloud over here at, you know, insert corporation name, right? And I just don't think that's realistic. You know, when I, I joined a cloud security posture management company in 2016, and we were in the very early days of cloud security posture management, right? And there was this big debate going on about what's the right approach, quote unquote, right approach to cloud security. Is it CSPM, which by nature is kind of a, let's observe what you're doing. We'll just kind of watch what you're doing, gather that up, and then show that picture back to you with an assessment of what's good and bad as either defined by whatever number of standards like NIST cybersecurity framework, CIS benchmark, whatever, or some rules that you yourself define, or is it this CASB approach, right? CASB was a very hot topic at the time, you know, cloud access security broker, where you're only going to use the cloud in a way that this CASB tells you is okay. So mm. some security team in theory would come along and define like, oh, okay, you know, Joe, he's with the development team and they have access to this, 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 this. Here's a set of rules for what they can and cannot do. We're going to translate those rules into like AWS IAM policies or VPC constraints or what have you, right? And as long as you kind of color within those lines, you're fine. And so it's, you know, does your organization continue to run and we're there observing it, CSPM approach, or do you take this thing that prescribes to you how is, you know, what good cloud usage is and you change everybody's workflow to adapt to that? And I can tell you, like in those days, what we observed time and time again, not to cast aspersions on, on CASB vendors out there, but no company was going to change their operating model in order to accommodate this CASB tool. It just was not going to happen. Why? People have day jobs. They have stuff hmm. that they're trying to get done. And nobody's day job is to change the way that they're working in order to onboard this new vendor offering. Like nobody's. Even in the security department that bought the thing, that's not really anybody's job description except maybe one or two people who are on that project team. And so I, I, I feel like there's a common problem that we have as a security industry that we try to sell a solution to everybody and anybody who will buy it, regardless of whether they're actually the right fit or whether they're going to get benefit out of it. And I can tell you as like an early stage security company, that's a dangerous temptation. Because of course we all want customers and we want revenue and we want to be growing. But worse than having the customer, it, it worse than not having the customer is having the customer that doesn't like the tool, that goes away with a bad experience, or that churns after one year. Because you've invested all this time and energy in cultivating the relationship and getting them on board, and then they're just gonna walk away. And you know, maybe you've educated them on a new space like API security, like we're doing but then they didn't like your approach because your approach required them to change. And so they're just going to go to some other API security vendor who doesn't even have to really pay much to acquire the customer because you've educated them on the market. You've educated them on the attack surface and the problems and so on. So I just feel like that's a, a bad temptation and a bad behavior that we as a vendor community have. Hmm. Yeah, that is definitely something that I have experienced personally. So is that kind of, is that experience, uh, what what you would say kind of led you down the path of, you know, starting Firetail and, and you know, let's talk about the tech a little bit, you know, maybe, yeah. you know, why you got involved with the company and what brought yeah. you down this path? Actually, what brought me down this path was my experience doing cloud security. Hmm. Um so a little bit less those kind of vendor things. I learned those lessons along the way. Um, but the previous company, Divi Cloud, you know, we were that early stage CSPM company. Um, we grew very rapidly for a four year period before being acquired. Partway along that journey, I started working with some of our larger customers, you know, digital natives, global organizations. 
and you started to observe how they were changing the way that they use cloud. So now, you know, every year we go to reInvent or whatever cloud, cloud conference you're, you're going to go to, and you hear from the CTOs and the CIOs about how they've really changed the way that they're operating their IT environments. And the consistent things that you hear are like, we're moving away from long-lived servers. We're, you know, we're doing um, cattle, not pets model. You know, you'll hear that pets versus cattle analogy a lot in the cloud secure in the cloud space in general. And really what it comes down to is like a virtual machine on a cloud network is not a server and you shouldn't treat it like a server. What is it? It's a temporary computing node that provides CPU memory, maybe a little bit of disk access in order to process a workload. But it should be ephemeral and it should be treated as ephemeral. And we really started to see that behavior from a lot of our large scale customers, especially again, those cloud native customers. We would ask them like, you know, and I'm, I'm much more familiar with AWS and the other cloud providers. So excuse me for just using their lingo, but we'd ask them like, what are you running on EC2? And they're like, as little as possible. In fact, we want to get everything off of EC2. And you say, well, what are you going to do instead? Containers and serverless. Why? Easier to be ephemeral, lighter compute load we can actually like cycle things in and out much more quickly. And guess what? I don't have an operating system that I have to maintain. I don't need to install agents. I don't need to install an EDR agent or a management agent or an APM or any of that stuff, right? I'm just going to run my workloads on Lambda because guess what? The vast majority of them fire up, run for 15 seconds, and then wind down. Like that's how I should be using cloud. That is the dream and the vision that Werner Fogels and everybody else tells me about every year, right? And so when we started seeing that shift, one of the things that I kind of realized in my conversations with some of them was that's going to dramatically change the architecture. And if it changes the architecture, what are the implications? What becomes the target? It moves away from being that EC2 instance, and then it becomes an API sitting on a network. So whether you're running Lambda, whether you're running Fargate, EKS, ECS, I don't care, you're going to have an API somewhere. Chances are very, very high. And that API is going to be in front of a data set, in front of a set of business functions, or both. And that becomes your attack surface. So that's what started me thinking about API security. And I started thinking about this problem a ways back and started working on it after I left uh, Rapid7, the company that acquired us. And that, that's really the journey. When we started Firetail, my co-founder and I, we actually started by not kind of having a piece of technology that we then wanted to build around, but we actually started by doing root cause analysis on all of the publicly disclosed API data breaches that we could find. There weren't that many at the time. We've now kind of consolidated them all. If you look on our website, firetail.io in the footer, you'll find a, uh, an API data breach tracker, we call it, where we've kind of put together a list of all of the ones we could find. And there's been kind of 40, 50 of them large scale over the past 10 years that have been publicly disclosed, probably far more than that that have not been disclosed. That tends to be the case. And what we realized was that the problem has actually, not only has the attack surface moved, but the problem has also moved. It's become less a problem of, let's say, accidental data exposure, which is still one of the main problems on cloud environments. And it becomes an application logic problem. It becomes things like abuse of poor authentication mechanisms or lack of, um, let's say, follow-up call authorization. So I authorize you once, but then I assume that anything you request after that, any of your subsequent API requests are also authorized. Very bad practice. You need to authorize every single call. Um, but we saw things like that time and again. And so we actually started from that standpoint, and we built out tech to kind of match that. And then we followed requests from customers to kind of continue to evolve what we're doing. We actually ended up kind of adding a completely new set of fun uh, features and functionality based on some of our early beta customer feedback. That's been a great learning journey for us. But yeah, that's how we got started. Hmm. That That's interesting. You know, moving to containerized environments, I mean, it's just... It's difficult, <laughs> you know, yeah. I feel like uh, it's easier said than done. And a lot of companies or people, you know, don't quite understand the work that goes behind that, you know, because as soon as you throw an agent on there, uh, you're eating up more utilization and you're spending more money 
on the solution than you would have been. And it's a considerable amount too. Um, and throwing an agent on something to secure it or gain a- insight is, you know, a legacy process. It's a legacy solution, you know? And, and so we're, the industry as a whole is having to, you know, learn new ways of how to actually gain insight into these ephemeral workloads. Right. And it's, it's difficult. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, to that point, Joe, you'll find people shifting a lot of their security efforts away from, let's say the runtime monitoring that you might get from an agent into like secure build. Right. So what all is in my pipeline? Have I done code scanning? Have I checked my third party dependencies? What about all these third party containers that I'm including to build my workload? Maybe I'm grabbing Nginx as a reverse proxy. So am I grabbing the right version? Is it the most secure version? Is it the compatible version? Like all of those types of questions, they almost become more of a, you know, to use the buzzword S-bomb type of problem um, than they do a runtime problem especially if they are more ephemeral workloads like that aren't going to be out there or where you've got a lot of code updates that are pushing new versions very regularly. You know, the secure build aspect becomes maybe more important than the secure runtime aspect. Um, But that is a challenge. And that is not something that a lot of security teams do, especially because who owns the build process? It's often not security. In fact, like 99% of the time, it's not security. It's developers, right? And, you know, I don't know how it is where you work, but I've certainly observed my share of organizations where security and developers don't always see eye to eye. Yeah, it's uh, that in and of itself, I feel like you need a security person that used to be a developer that converted to a security team, you know, to actually like speak their language and break down those walls and barriers um, because it's a difficult I mean, it's a difficult uh, experience to bridge, right? It's a diff- difficult gap to bridge with someone coming in saying, you know, oh, we should restrict this in this way or do it a different way. You know, in the developer's head, it's like, have you ever been a developer before? Do you know what you're talking right. about? Do you understand right. why we did it this right. way? Something that is pretty difficult for, for myself even, and thankfully, you know, my current employer, we have an AppSec guy that, you know, is primarily a developer that is just having a security focus. And even at my last employer, the entire AppSec team was former developers that, you know, wanted to have a security focus and they created this team around them. I really feel like that's the only way to really do it successfully because I've I've tried it just about every other way and it just doesn't work. Yeah, it can be really challenging. And I think like, thankfully you've got this AppSec person in place that's able to maybe kind of bridge the gap and speak the language of both sides. But I find that even, you know, on the most basic level, a lot of the times the organization is not set up for success because the, let's say the KPIs or the targets are very different. You've got a development team for whom security is at best a secondary responsibility and at worst, not even on their list of responsibilities they're tasked with delivering features and they've got maybe time pressure. They've got pressure to release because why you're in a competitive market and management says we need this feature to be competitive or to be ahead of the competition or whatever. And they've got, you know, their bosses breathing down their necks to deliver, deploy, deliver, deploy. Right. And nowhere in that list is, is security. And then you've got your job, which is keep the organization safe. And so sometimes even just the basic kind of misalignments at the organizational level I've seen can really cause a lot of strife. And that's really unfortunate because nobody wants to ship insecure code. Nobody wants to open the organization up to vulnerabilities. But when you create these systems that don't have a holistic view, I think that's a, a pretty you know poor management structure. Yeah, absolutely. So where do you... Um... Where do you envision this space going? Because it seems like you're taking this approach from a different angle that, I mean, personally, I would like to see more solutions approach it from. Where do you see it going? Yeah. So we came to API security from cloud security. 
And one of the other things I observed, aside from, let's say, the architectural changes on the cloud security side, was that I saw the customers that we were working with struggling to implement cloud security because of any number of reasons. But one of the big ones was a lot of the times once security comes to the table on the cloud security side, development is way out ahead. A number of workloads are already out there. Applications are already running in production, et cetera. So a lot of these customers that we would work with, let's say on a POC process or whatnot, one of the very first things they would do on the cloud security side is they would say, okay, great. Now I have a picture of my entire cloud, let's say a state. Help me now slice it up and break it down into manageable chunks like application workloads. And that I saw really becoming like a consistent theme. So company after company, customer after customer, we would see like the first set of workloads, it would be like, hey, help us manage tags or help us create these like structures that we can then measure security against because it's not one size fits all. You've got a different risk profile for different workloads depending off their internal, external, what data might be in them. Do they have customer PII in them? All these types of questions that might uh, change the security requirements for them. So what I see happening is I think cloud security will continue to go that direction. And so, you know, people like you who work in cloud security day to day, I think whether you're there already or not, or whether you're going to get there in the next couple of years, I think you will get pulled down the direction of slicing your cloud security practice up into manageable workloads, namely applications. What we've seen from the API security side is that cloud security is starting to encompass everything that kind of sits below the API. So infrastructure layer, identity and access management, um, operating system, especially for things like you know, Kubernetes clusters, that's all kind of part of a cloud security platform nowadays. You, you talk to any of the now now called CNAP vendors, CSPM is very last, last uh, decade, right? But you talk to any of the CNAP vendors and they'll be able to give you all of that. What they're missing is the API security piece on the, on the top of it, which is a really interesting intersection of data, business logic, application functionality, and external exposure. And so our goal with what we're doing at Firetail is to make kind of the discovery of APIs very easy and then something that you can take and integrate into a cloud security program or an application security program. Um, also make it so that you can deploy controls for some of those top attack vectors that we've observed. So can we do good authentication and authorization checks? Can we give you good visibility into when API calls aren't looking the way that they should relative to some of those risk factors? That's where we're trying to take it. And we're trying to make it a piece that is very easily consumed as part of a broader kind of cloud slash cloud AppSec program. Hmm. Yeah, it's a very interesting take. And I I wish that we had more time today to talk about it, but that, that just means that I'll have to have you back on to talk about it more in depth. Well, Jeremy, it, yeah, absolutely. You know, Jeremy, before I let you go, um, you know, how about you tell my audience where they can find you if they wanted to reach out, where they can find Firetail, you know, and all that good information if they wanted to learn more. Yeah, the website's real easy. We are just firetail.io. Um, I am just Jeremy at firetail.io. So very easy to, you know, get in touch with me. Um, I have a Twitter handle, but I won't even share it because I never use it. <laughs> uh, the company has a Twitter handle, which is firetail underscore IO. We're not super active on there. So I would say email is probably the best way to reach out to us. Last thing I'll probably mention on that side is not a lot of people are super aware of API security and the risks that it might pose. So one of the things we've tried to do is to really summarize some of that root cause work that we did at the beginning of our own journey. So if you go to our website now, across the top, you'll see the state of APIs in 2023. There's a free download report there. Um, that'll tell you, you know, some of the analysis that we've done around API security breaches, what went wrong in those situations, et cetera. That's a great place to get uh, to kind of get started if you're looking at the space. Otherwise, just reach out anytime. Thanks, Sherry, for coming on. I really appreciated our conversation. Really enjoyed it. And I hope everyone enjoyed this episode.